Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Anne Reeve, and I am an associate curator at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC. And I'm thrilled to be joined tonight by artist Ava Lewitt, whose work is currently on view in an exhibition on the museum's third floor entitled, Put It This Way, Revisions of the Hirshhorn Collection. I will offer a brief introduction and then invite Ava to turn on her camera. But before I do, I just wanted to thank Joy and and Julie, who are providing card captioning and ASL translation services for us tonight. Um, and I also want to encourage anyone who is willing and interested to ask us questions throughout the conversation, which um, should last about 30 or 40 minutes between myself and Ava, you can use the prompt at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask uh, questions for Ava, which we're going to set aside maybe 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the hour to, to do. So Ava was born in Spoleto, Italy, and I believe she still spends quite a bit of her time there, but she mostly grew up in New York, which is where she continues to live and work. Her sculptures and installations are, I find, sensitive and beguiling constructions that often use commercial manufactured materials that can be manipulated by hand. So mesh, silicone, sponges, other store-bought items that Lewitt then dyes, casts, stains, bends, drapes, uh, and ultimately imbues with a new feeling, tension, and sometimes even personality. Space, light, and architecture are also part of this process, and she has worked site responsively at a fairly monumental scale, uh, as well as more human scale, and that is the scale that is demonstrated in the work in our show. She has an increasingly impressive list of exhibitions behind her. In the past few years alone, she has held exhibitions at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston, the Jewish Museum in New York, the Aldrich Museum of Contemporary Art in Ridgefield, Connecticut, and the Clark Institute at Williams College, which is in Williamstown, Massachusetts. She had a beautiful show at the Luring Augustine Gallery in New York in 2022. And also in 2022, she was commissioned to design the sets for a Justin Peck ballet, Partita, which was performed by the New York City Ballet Company in January of last year. It's quite a resume for an artist, and I'm very happy to be speaking with Ava today. So uh, with that, I will invite you to turn on your, your camera. I think. I'm not sure how to turn my camera on. <laughs> no worries. No worries. There should oh. be bottom left. Um, there you go. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Right. Hello. That was Hi. good. That was some good dramatic build up yes. there. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us tonight and taking Thank the time. You. Um, you know, I've curated this show that is on, on view now, and I'm so thrilled that your work is in the show, but you and I have never met in person, and um, we haven't had too much of a chance to talk before tonight, so I'm really excited to learn more from you about uh, not only the work that's in our show, um, but sort of your broader practice and how, how that work relates to, to other work and past efforts. Um, by way of an opening, uh, I, will, I will say that I have found your work to be incredibly sophisticated uh, work, which also at the same time has the ability to call me into a feeling of play. And I don't mean a superficial feeling, but a, a place where I'm asked to be curious about things that I might otherwise overlook, like a sponge or a piece of foam. And it's a relationship to the world that I maybe had a lot as a child and have maybe lost a bit as an adult where, you know, one can encounter an object and one's surroundings in a way that is really curious and in the moment and where you're sort of learning through through touch. Um, it's a sense of, of wonderment where you're maybe able to approach something without prejudice or preconception that you build up as an adult as you're just kind of barreling through, <laughs> through life. Um, and it's, it's a powerful feeling. I found it to be a powerful feeling. And so I'm I'm wondering if and how that that idea resonates for you and whether there are any early memories 
um, or even early encounters with material that you look back on and think, oh, there was there was the start of something there for me as an artist? Um, well, I just want to say first, before I answer that question, <laughs> I just want to thank you and thank, thank you for um, it's such an honor to be in the show that um, with so many other amazing artists and um, I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk to you. So um, thank you for the question. I, I do really think about play between materials. It's often, um, you know, thinking about a material and then another material that will interact with that material to somehow bring out the best in both of them, you know, every material has an inherent quality that can be, you know, sponge can be spongier, um, latex can be floppier. So searching for two materials that sort of bring out the best in one another is often something that I'm trying to do. And I think one maybe early memory is you know, just being <laughs> given a pile of kind of scrap material and figuring out what to do with it, figuring out how to be creative with it and finding the in inherent value in, you know, off cuts of paper, rubber bands, old plastic containers, here's some paint, how can we make these all play nicely together to mm -hmm. create something that every, everyone, everything ends up happier and the better version of itself. That's all. Well, let's, let's look at the, the work that is in, that is on view currently at the museum and talk maybe about how some of that comes together in this piece, which is uh, titled, or it's untitled, Perrin's Orange Oval. Um, and maybe you could talk to us about what it is that we're looking at, what the materials are that you used here and how you brought them together. The central spine is polyurethane foam that's cut to, to squares. And then there's plastic, um, plexiglass is the rigid black. And then the PVC um, is the, bright orange. So I, I did a series of these pieces where there was a spine, they were vertical pieces, and then the material that was inserted into them was the materials that I was speaking about that are, you know, I'm trying to, uh, they're, they're playing together, I'm trying to bring out the, the most them qualities, the <laughs> most inherently, yeah. um, trying to bring out their, their best in, in each other while also formally making it visually interesting and formally beautiful. So, and they do a lot of that work for me already. Mm -hmm. you know? And so the sort of spine is the, um, it's the grid, it's the, the regularity. And then the, so it's like the X axis and then the Y axis is where I get to play. So I did a series of, of these works where sort of, you know, it's the algebraic almost, I don't wanna make it sound not interesting, but um, you know, this irregular part and then there's the, the other part where I get to, to play and those materials get to play with one another. Mm -hmm. And there's all, all sorts of contradictions that are sort of creating or oppositional forces that are creating nice balance and tension sort of and softness and rigidity in the vertical and the horizontal. Um, this is a work which, and this picture kind of shows it at a distance, it, it, it does all sorts of things as you move closer to it and, and farther away um, in the way that it calls on light and reacts to light. It sort of creates this force field. So you can see it, in, this is the work installed now. Um, you can see a work by Liz Deschen and Mary Bauermeister just next to it. But I think we have some details of your piece. In fact, I know, in fact, I know we do. And maybe we could look at those um, and start to get a sense of how, how these things come together when you're up close. Um, so do you use or did you use adhesive for this or 
Or um, the, the spine is adhered to the, to the cleat, but these, the black and the orange, the latex and the plexi are just kind of sandwiched in between, mm -hmm. um, which I think is important. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of gravity in my work. There's a lot of um, inner chemistry happening that I think is important. There is gravity at play that allows the materials to, to be their finest and to do their thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, a lot of the, the adjectives that you were describing this work with is not even down to me. It's just down to the materials themselves. They're the ones who create that mystery and that, and I just am the one that gets to place them next to each other so that they can harmonize that way. Um. Can you also, maybe you could, or a quality that I always find really interesting or that I, and, and that I really love is the way that you seem to be able to take something that is manufactured and potentially exists in the world, thus exists in the world in a very impersonal way and bring it back to a hand and the quality of the personal. And maybe you could talk about that as its own kind of tension for a little bit. I'd be interested to hear your, your thoughts on that. Hmm. Well, I think that's, that might not be very intentional on my part. I'm attracted to certain materials and I'm attracted to um, the Tan tangible qualities in a lot of these man-made materials. I'm not sure why I'm attracted to color. I'm attracted to softness. A lot of these materials have that in them already. And I think I just putting, juxtaposing them against other materials, um, but in sort of a really innocent way, I think brings out the, 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 human quality and then it, it makes them kind of relatable in a way and I also make you know I hand cut everything and there are imperfections it doesn't they don't really look machine made when when you're up close to them so I think that also lends some kind of person personality to them um we already have a question that I think funnels in nicely here. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it now. But um, someone is wondering if you use discarded or found plastics or materials or whether you're sort of more intentionally seeking out and, and purchasing. I might start with a found material and then say, oh, wow, like, I love this material. I might not have chosen out, chosen to go out and buy it. Um, but then I do definitely go in in deep into that into that material research and try to find all the different kinds of it. So it might start with some recycled something coming my way, but then I do a deep dive into yeah. it. Yeah. Um. Well, why don't we go on to the next set of images that we have, which are from the installation that you did at the Jewish Museum in 2018 for a piece called Untitled Flora. Uh, can you can you talk to us about sort of the origin story of this work and, and how it came together for you? Yes, so this was a really fun project. I, um, it was, it, it's such a beautiful and neutral space that I really wanted to cover the walls sort of with, I, I really wanted to make it into a garden, a garden of, uh, you know, a garden of Eden mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. sorts, sort of a, a little bit of a play on, you know, um, the Old Testament, if you will. But really it was in, when you zoom in all about the play between materials and the weight of um, the kind of flop of the plastic with these sort of, bunches of of uh, flora and like how that um you know the, the the rigid the vertical parts are adhered to the wall but then the kind of 
branches are just free to flop. So there was uh, uh, also a lot of gravity at play in this work. And I kind of got to surround the whole lobby with these. So I thought it was a really, I thought it was really fun. And they were really um, excited about me kind of trying to put them as, as many places as I could. So you were offered this space um, as its own sort of blank canvas, right? Mm-hmm. And this, this piece evolved out of out of your sort of relationship to the site or visiting the site. Uh, I know it may be hard to describe, but I'm wondering if you can talk about how you process that, how you begin with an empty space like that um, and start developing your sense of how you want to to fill it or charge it? Well, I knew that this space, because it's so monochromatic and so singularly one material, the walls, the desk, the floor, all one material. So I thought, oh, I can use any color. I can really be, you know, go full blast with the color and, um, and full blast with the, you know, just the the breadth of like where I placed the work, um, and I knew that the the space would would hold its own because it's yeah. so um, it's so strong and uh, you know it was all travertine stone yeah. and it was really a good um, counterbalance to anything that I would do. So it was actually really a pretty freeing project to do. I felt really free as to all the things that I could do there. Was there anything that um, surprised you when it was all installed and you could finally enter the sort of fully, fully, full treatment of the space as it had lived in here? Um, Was there anything about the way that the work came together as a whole that maybe you hadn't anticipated? Well, it wasn't, difficult installation and in that there it was a one day installation it was uh, the, the the museum is closed on this one day so it was a lot of um imagination a lot a lot of um and, and I didn't actually know which pieces would go where when we arrived so it was a little bit of let's try that one there let's try that one there but not um not a lot of uh there weren't a lot of uh, knowns going into it. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that's actually it's, um, leads me to a question about preparatory process and materials. I mean, are you doing schematics or drawings for installations like this? Are you responding completely or more intuitively in the moment? I do drawings. I, I try to be as organized as I can and plan as much as I can, but I also like to be able to pivot and I never want to be too precious Mm -hmm. I always want to be able to switch something up this is the the whole world that I'm operating in I feel is a huge privilege so I never want to it's never the end of the world with these works they're soft mostly I can pick them up and move them you know, there's always a solution. So even if I adhere strictly to a drawing, yeah, mm-hmm. well, I can work around it. If I yeah, to. yeah. Um, let's go on. Let's go into the next next project, which is an image from an installation that you developed in New York in 2019, untitled "Fish House," which is also a great name. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could talk about the title, but also how you, I, I believe this was also site responsive work. So maybe how, how you developed this set of ideas for this specific location. Yes. So this piece was at Bloomberg Philanthropies in their meeting meeting room, which they use every day. Everyone eats lunch in there every day. And it's like a really highly trafficked um, main space for the company and um, Fish House was the the name of the, the the mansion that Bloomberg Philanthropies is now housed in. Right. So I all my work is untitled. So I just 
sometimes choose names like Flora to differentiate, you know, just descriptive kind of location based. But Fish House was <laughs> sure. good not to include. So, so this piece was, I actually, it's a little bit hard to see in these pictures, but I was really responding to these orange chairs, which were something they were, this is, these are the chairs. This is the table. These are the chairs. There's these really bright chairs and um, you can't actually really tell maybe in the picture, but I really tried to make the kind of the cleat at the top, sort of the, the, the regular, the regularity in the piece. They're all kind of just different shades of orange. And I really wanted to bring that color into it just to kind of make the chairs feel at home and make the room feel, you know, like it was the, the chairs were talking to the wall and yeah. the, you know, just kind of create an energy in the room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can, you can feel it. I mean, I, I know what you mean about these images, but I think it comes through even, even through a screen. Um, you mentioned the uh, untitled that all of your work is untitled so I was just wondering if you had a particular rationale there or a particular connection to to the way that you title the work that's interesting for us to to hear about I think I think there probably is <laughs> I think there are a lot of artists who title their work for a particular reason and I I I don't want to take away. I, there's no reason for me to try to imbue something with a title that isn't already there that I feel is important and and very interesting in a lot of artwork, but wouldn't be interesting in my work. So I don't do it, and I don't think I I ever will. Hmm. No, that is really interesting. Is there a sense there that the work? for you exists more in a in a haptic place than in a in a cerebral place or or intellectual place yeah i think you could say that yeah. um i i think it's it it speaks for itself i would like it to speak for itself mm -hmm. yeah um let's go on to the next set of images from the project that you did at the Aldrich, which I think was the first time that you would use this material. Yes. Mesh. So yeah. Yeah, talk to us about this installation, which looks incredible. So this was, a, a, a ex, this piece, I was really responding to the architecture of this room, which is this really yeah. incredible long space but it has these gaps between the sort of drop ceiling and the wall and to me that was the perfect opportunity to kind of bring the the wall out into the room so I kind of created these um, um, shapes with the with the mesh um, which you know it's it's hard to tell because there's a lot of color variation going on but Basically, I was trying to deepen the, the image that you would put on the wall and, you know, really make it three dimensional. And this piece will always be um, really difficult to understand in, in photos because the mesh really does a funny lenticular thing when you're walking through it. And I think that's also really great about uh, this space and this project that it was such a kind of unique experience to be to be in so mm -hmm. how did you approach color in this in this specific installation it, um i made a model i i, I tried to make the color of progression, but I also was working from a limited palette. So I knew that there was only gonna be um, a certain amount of, of variation with the color, but that was okay. And it sort of, in my mind went from, you know, really warm to sort of warmish cool. And 
that was the progression in my mind. But it, in reality, I don't know if it read like that, but I don't think it, I don't think it really mattered in the end. Were you ever able to, to sort of, um, I, I don't imagine that you were able to fully install this before it arrived at the Aldrich or were you, yeah. were you sort of mocking up certain parts of it in the studio? Yeah. Yeah. But not the full thing until no. you landed. No. Okay. Yeah. That's a nice crescendo. Too. Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of my work I'm, I'm, it's just, um, crossing my fingers and, and hoping that it turns out how I want it to, because the, you know, being able to work on this scale is um, really incredible, but no one has, I don't have enough space to be able to really mock this up. So I do my best in my studio and cross my fingers. Um. I'm excited to talk about these next works in particular. I believe they're the first outdoor works that you've done, although please correct me, please correct me if I'm wrong there. And these are from an installation in 2020 at the Clark, um, in Williamstown at the Clark, which is in the Berkshires and just this beautiful, expansive rolling landscape that sort of takes your breath away. Um, I imagine it was, a lot of fun to sort of work outdoors and in that kind of landscape. So I'm, I'd love to hear hear how this came together and how how working in an outdoor environment may have changed changed the way you had to work or um, or you know helped you find new push you push you a little further. Yes. Well, it was the the materials that I work with inherently not that durable. So it was interesting to search for the materials that would hold up for a whole year. This show was up for a year, which really the pieces got to each, you know, they got to have a season, which I thought was really beautiful. So that was a really interesting exploration. And then the addition of the, of light and landscape as materials in themselves was very um, I, interesting and I, and I really loved that. So that was um, something totally new and really, really fun to explore. Um, and when did you, did you know right away that you wanted to sort of work with totems, real vertical, like dramatic verticals in a more horizontal landscape? I did, I, I did, I, I knew, I, I didn't know that. I knew that I wanted to work with resin. I knew that I wanted something that would refract light that, you know, that would um, have its own chemistry with the, with the material at, at each different season, at each, you know, the sun rises at different levels. The, the light, especially in the Berkshires is so dramatic and different at every season, the trees are different in every season. So I really wanted a material that would absorb and refract all of that, that was um, already a material that was available freely. So that was something I knew. And the, the physical manifestation of that, I, I knew that I wanted to kind of mimic um, the verticality of the trees. Um, and I originally wanted it to be sort of more of a copse of trees, sort of, you know, a little bit more um, uh, kind of organic, but I, I think that the, the rigidity and the sort of um, the, the pride of these three individual straight pieces really made an impact on the landscape, against the landscape and really kind of in conversation with the modernity of the building, which you can see from, from there, which is really so beautiful and also kind of speaks to the landscape. So, yeah, I think that the, the, the site kind of told me eventually what was best. What it, what it wanted. Um, if you go to that um, close-up image on the next on the next page or the yeah, thank you. Um, 
this to me bears an interesting relationship or a little bit, not only in terms of color, but shape and sort of repetitive horizontals to the, the work that's at the that's at the Hirshhorn. And so I was kind of, you know, wondering about relationships between works, conversations between works, what you sort of might learn from a work like Untitled Orange Oval that ends up calling, you know, calling itself into another project later down the line. Yes. Well, it is, it's the same material. Um, and uh, part of it is actually going back to the, um, First question is a little bit of recycling. It's a little bit of like, what do I have? What do I know? What am I, what's in my studio that I can play with? And then part of it is also the, the way that this particular material stands out in, in, in the oval, it stands out against the kind of um, absorbency of the black plastic. And in this case, it stands out against the, the sky and the grass, and it really has um, a, a sureness about it that a lot of materials don't have. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's a special material. Um, we have a specific question that has popped up about the, the towers. So um, the question is asking, this viewer is asking about art historical references and if and how that works its way into the to the process. And in this case, in particular, if there was a Mondrian um, idea. Um, I actually I, there are tons of art historical yeah. references, <laughs> um, but I don't know if Mondrian would have been one of them. I would have I would have um, very. Um, uh, shyly said Brancusi, but I would also never put my name in the same sentence as his. So um, I'll do it. I'll do uh, it. I will say Brancusi. <laughs> yes, that would that would have been probably the reference that was most front of my mind. But gosh, I don't think you could um, ever come to the end of the list of references for this. But Mondrian is um, an interesting one mm -hmm. that I I hadn't thought of. So I will think about it. <laughs> well, so um, so who are some of the the touchstones for you, or the references that are often funneling their way through, or or pinging against the the work? You know, this one, but maybe also in general. Um, well, there are there are a few that I happen to be in the show with, which is a huge honor. Um, I think uh, Isa Genskin is a huge influence. Um, not only formally in some of her work, which I do, um, you know, uh, respect and admire, but also just the kind of um, the breadth of her work. And I think looking at an artist like her really gives me courage to do anything. And I love that her work is so diverse and so um, weird at times. And I just, I, I love that. Yeah, the, the the weirdness and the sort of steadfastness, and I've always found it very unapologetic and yeah. sort of like forthright and, you know, like funny, but sometimes perversely funny. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, well, that, thank you for, um, you sort of led me to that because I, I was I was wondering about, um, you know, a, a relationship to other artists in the show um and whether you know there are any in particular I have you know was happy to do a bit of reading about your work earlier today and and Dorothea Rockburn was a name that came up Ava Hesse was a name that came up um and so I was wondering you know what you might have taken from each of them that is in your toolkit now as a as an artist mm. well it's I think um, you wouldn't have to stop just there. I think you could yeah. go down the list of, um, and I, it's, it's hard to say what comes from where, but I think um, there are formally things that I love and respect, but also I love, I, I think I see the way that a lot of these women artists 
these female artists' careers have developed over time. And I think that is something that really inspires me a lot, more, more so than um, what my work might have in common with theirs or what I've taken from, from their work. Just the, the, the breadth and the evolution of their work from, from A to B to C to D to E to F to Z, uh, you know, that really gives me um, a lot of hope and inspiration and uh, um, just confidence that, that, you know, this is a, a lifelong ambition and that my, my work can change, their work can change still. Um, and that I think is something I take that I, I'm, I'm sort of funneling that away because to I think all of us can take take from that, or I know that that is a really inspiring and lovely idea to, to me in turn. Um, I, maybe you'll indulge me for a minute, and Amy, maybe we could go back to some install shots of the show that are, we'll, we'll hop back and then we can move forward again. But, um, you know, the you graciously sort of maybe let us into this a little bit by referencing um, these women artists. And this is a show of works from the Hirschhorn collection made by women and gender non-conforming artists. And when I first started thinking about the show, I found that really exciting, but also kind of really daunting because in my head was the narrative of so many artists um, really sort of, of the of the last century, you sort of names like Joan Mitchell and Louise Nevelson, artists in the show, but who spoke, you know, really powerfully about not wanting their work to be seen in that kind of context, you know, not being seen as a, a woman artist. And so I wondered, you know, in this generation, in this moment, what your relationship is to that idea. And if there are ways in which you feel that your gender works its way into the work and if there are ways in which it, it lives apart? Hmm. Well, I, I see it, um, it, in a way it's interesting in a show with this many artists in it, it almost matters less it, it, because yeah. it's so, the, the work is so diverse in there. I'm sure you even had to, uh, I'm sure it seemed like, um, you could have included hundreds more artists, yeah. but you couldn't, yeah. you know? So, um, and, and because the work in the show is so diverse, it covers so many different um, kind of genres of, of work. It doesn't seem to be, the least interesting focus is the fact that it was made, that the works were made by women and gender non-conforming artists. There's so many different, um, media and so many different, um, you know, movements represented, um, so and, many, yeah. yeah. And so, for, some, you know, and so many different relationships to the idea of gender and the significance of gender yeah. in the work. And, and, you know, for some artists it's really Im embedded in there and part of the way the work was intended to create meaning and live in the world and for others not relevant at all so that yeah exactly. yeah 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 and in terms of my work I think I identify much more as a as a sculptor than as a as a woman artist yeah and I think it would be easier to talk about the difficulties of being a sculptor than being a, a woman artist although being a, a female sculptor is also hard but you know sculpture is it's a pain in the ass it's unwieldy it's big you have to put it somewhere you know it's, it's it'll fight you it'll fight it's you. annoying yeah, but yeah I can't do anything I can't I couldn't make a painting I couldn't even make a drawing practically so it's a um something it's a, something I have to bear much more than I feel that I have to bear being being a woman in in my per particular experience yes yeah. well so let's let's talk about that so um what is it about sculpture? <laughs> what is it about sculpture that that you know makes it the place where you have to have to live? 
think I have to live in, in um, 3D, in materiality, in, um, in phys- physicality, in weight, in, um, in the absorbency of color, the absorbency of light, reflectivity. I think I have to have all of those um, at, at my fingertips in order to um, feel like I can make something interesting. Mm-hmm. But you, did you start as a painter? Um, yes, a painter? yes. Or did yes. you sort of start as a sculptor and know I right think, away that that was, that was it? I think looking back from even being a child, my most um, fun creative endeavors were, were definitely sculptural and using kind of these cast off materials to make, make things. Um, but I think inevitably you're funneled down a sort of painting path in school because who wants to deal with students, sculptures, no one. So, you know, you make paintings and that was, um, really, really hard and makes you question like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Um, and then the freedom to rediscover sculpture was, you know, a, a relief. A breath. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like a breath and a challenge. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for indulging that detour. Amy, why don't we go back to the last couple of, of projects that we have images from here? And then we have, we do have um, a few other questions that are coming in, but if anyone has more, please do share. Uh, so yeah, this was the show, the relatively recent show from ICA Boston, which I was so sad to miss, but they have such an incredible um, space that I, I believe this is right on the well, sort of a wall of windows that's overlooking yeah. the water, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, tell us about this, this project. So this was sort of a material marriage between the Aldrich and um, the Fish House project. So I knew that I wanted to do something of this, um, the, you know, kind of these um, floating spheres. And I knew that the mesh would really react well to this light filled space and kind of, you know, after, I think this was pretty concurrent with um, the Clark. So it was really thinking about light and yeah. how light would be this other material in the work and um, how, you know, uh, in a space this large, how moving around this work would, would, uh, it would look different to everyone because, you know, I think you can sort of see it, right? It almost, if you stand right in front of it, it disappears. And if you stand like to the side of it, it looks really um, m- most itself, which is kind of an interesting paradox for art. You know, if you stand in front of it, you can't see it. And then if you stand inside, you can. So um, it was a really kind of big, fun, beautiful space to be able to play with this material. Um, a question has come in about about material actually and and color and whether you are using materials in the color in which they come to you or whether you are having custom colors made or whether you're sort of working to to finesse color or whether you're working with what you get I yes I both I always will gravitate towards primaries it's my kind of safe place you know it's my comfort um and then um so there's always kind of a primary representation and then um the other colors I I bring in so um some of these colors are um available and then the other ones I I dye to kind of fill out the picture so in this installation there's a kind of a light pink and kind of a baby blue that I that I hand dyed just to kind of finish the picture so to speak Mm -hmm. that's beautiful 
Um, well, the last project that I think we have images of is from 2021, an installation at the New Britain Museum of Art, um, which also, I guess, ha bears a relationship to that ICA installation in turn and um, is another sort of has a relationship to the wall, but becomes this three-dimensional experience as you're as you're moving through it. Um, so tell us about this this project. So yes, I wanted to um, use the same materials because you know you're it's a stairwell. You're going to be moving through it, so the the work will shift as as you inevitably have to move through the space, which. Um, it is interesting and un unexpected, but then you can also view the work um, from where this photo was taken. So it can be a formally static picture, or it can be kind of something that, um, you know, is feels like an individual experience as you move up the stairs and as you move your head, you know, everyone is a different height coming from a different, place looking at it in a, in a different way. So it's gonna be an individual experience for, for everyone. So I liked that, that it was in this um, place that people will be constantly moving through. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, 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 a site bucket list? I mean, given the, the way that your work responds to spaces, I'm wondering if there are are any any out there where you are itching to? I think no, no. <laughs> but I but I would challenge myself to never say no to anything. Oh, so yeah. I think if anything comes my way, I would try to conceive of something that would be right for for it. And a lot of these projects have come that way, and it's been a, a challenge to kind of figure out what what work would really fit and what would be right for that space. Bring out the best in in the piece, bring out the best in the space and vice versa. Mm -hmm. That is its own inspiration in terms of, yeah, facing down things that might seem unsolvable at first. Yes. But sort of chip, chip away at. Yeah. Um, well, so that that brings us to the end of our images. I I have one one question that came up today, or one thing I wanted to ask you about um, a quote, and then we have one one remaining question in the Q and A, which we can. Do, use. do we? We don't have images from the Lorraine Augustine show. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. We, we do, do, don't we? Yeah. We're comparing the conclusion. This is yes. This is <laughs> from 2022, and I think this is your most recent um exhibition so please <laughs> please forgive me um that's okay that's okay there's yeah a lot of it. So i i was i was tracking tracking a few different open windows here with questions um tell us about this beautiful show so these these sort of individual hanging suspended columns have We've worked with them for quite some time, but we actually haven't seen any images of them yet in tonight's presentation. So can you talk about that form and and the way that you feel it it achieves something that you're after in in space. So yes, yeah, so it's it's more of um, you know bringing the the work, for instance, from the ICA and from the New Britain Museum into like real life 3D, so really giving that shape um, a kind of physical reality and really giving it weight and really um, kind of composing it in space so that, you know, if it all kind of, if they all had to line up against the wall, they would kind of create a similar composition to the New Britain Museum or Boston or, um, uh, fish house. So kind of just really um, thinking these materials through in, in to, um, into full 3D. Yeah. Um, you've used the word composition a few times and I was 
thinking as I was looking at this as someone who long ago read music but doesn't anymore, um, how there was how this was reminding me a little bit of a musical score and and the way that these elements were reading um within a field and so i know that you had you did a, a the set recently the set piece for the new york city ballet which was i believe both an original musical composition and a, a new choreographed piece um so i was i was wondering about your relationship to music or the work's relationship to music and and if there is one in your mind and what that might be? Um, well, but so it, it wasn't an original musical piece, but it was original choreography, an original set and costume and lighting. Um, but the, the music was um, from 2013. So, but that was actually kind of like a nice touchstone because it was music that I already knew and loved. So kind of had, um, you know, maybe a, a little bit of a rhythm in mind, but also it's it's something that I I don't think too much about. I can't think too much about it, or I think I would uh, I would be out of my depth. But I just kind of tried to make it have a little bit of a rhythm, a little bit of a balance, a little yeah. bit of a you know. But yeah. it's simultaneously extremely important and something that I can't think about too much or it will become unimportant. Yeah, no, but I think it's an interesting, I mean, at least for me, that sort of analogy between a note and a chord, right? Or a sort of word and a right. phrase. They're sort of yes. operating at all those those levels. Yes, I, um, I'm not a synesthete, but I think I can see the kind of right uh, com compositional rhythm in my mind in in sculpture mm -hmm. yeah um well thank you for bringing us to a more proper conclusion i would not want to <laughs> i would not have wanted to to miss these um but I am noticing, well, by way of sort of bringing us to a conclusion, and I, I do want to encourage if anyone has has final questions, um, do let us know. But there's a lovely question in, in the chat, which I think would be a, a nice place to end, which is um, about advice for young artists who are beginning their careers. Yeah. And if you if you have learned anything that that you might share by way of yeah by way of advice, hmm. gosh, that's that's hard. I wouldn't ever want to give bad advice, but and it might sound cheesy, but I think it's just to trust yourself. And if you're if you're scared or unsure, just go deeper, deeper, deeper into yourself. You know, just make it more. Um, more of what, even what you're afraid of, you know, more, more, more anything that you feel a little bit insecure about, just really dive deep into that. Dive into the discomfort. Yeah. Well, this is, I'm, we've, we've ended up with this theme of sort of art advice as life advice, because certainly not even as an artist, I feel like yeah. I, I can take from that. Um, Let's see. Oh, we have that has prompted more. The chat is alive. So um, would you like to say something about your father and his influence on your work? Um, well, he was a few a huge influence, obviously. Um, I think his um, probably more of his methodology of of work as opposed to the, the content of his work. You know, I, when I was growing up, I didn't necessarily understand the, the context that he was making his work in, but I knew how he made work and I knew um, how, how that produced work that, um, you know, really gave, gave, meaning and I, I think that he respected art of all different types in in my um lifetime or you know as an example growing up he definitely didn't discriminate you know he loved um he loved film he loved music he loved um a, a lot of different artists from all different walks of life so he he definitely 
there was a diversity to the respect that he kind of gave to the things that he loved. And then there was kind of a way that he made work that was um, an, an important lesson in how to, how to work, how to be an artist, how to um, give yourself to your work every day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so what is your, your studio world then? Um, what world mm-hmm. have you built for yourself as an artist, um, which allows you to, to tap into that impulse and creativity and, and challenge every day? Well, I, I'm very lucky to have a studio that I, is my happy place. It's my safe place. I love coming here every day. It's like a relief to come here every day. Um, and I, I'm very lucky to have that, but um, I like to be alone. So it can be, it can be, I can put a lot of pressure on myself to do everything myself, but I think it's worth it to have the kind of solitude and safe space that I've created. Um, although I do have lots of um, help with the things that I'm not good at, um, like um, organizational computer things. Thank you, Lauren Augustine. <laughs> Very, very gracious, gracious colleagues yeah. at Learning Augustine, and I want to certainly thank them for their help in um, preparing us for this evening. Um, but and I also want to thank those of those of you who have spent the hour with us. Um, it's been a pleasure to to gather us all for this conversation with Ava. Ava, most of all, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It was really fun. And thanks really to everyone fun. who's watching and. Um, Yes, I, just, I hope we can encourage everybody to come to the Hershorn, and come see Ava's work, um, come experience what it does uh, to you and for you, for yourself. And Ava, thank you for your time. We're so grateful. Thank you. And, and to hear from you tonight. So thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.